Anti-union moves at the state house and Democrats search for a candidate for governor. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Joe Ingalls, State House reporter for Ohio Public Radio, Julie Carr Smythe, State House correspondent for the Associated Press, Bob Clegg, Republican strategist, and Sam Gresham of Common Cause Ohio. It's only February of 2017. We still have 21 months before the 2018 election, but some Democrats are getting a little antsy about who will be their candidate for governor. Here are some of the names floating out there. Congressman Tim Ryan of Youngstown and Consumer Protection Bureau head Richard Cordray are the two biggest names. Nan Whaley, the mayor of Dayton, is considering running, as is former Congresswoman Betty Sutton, former Youngstown Mayor Jay Williams, and former state rep and state treasurer candidate Connie Pillich. There are some other names out there, but we will start with those. Julie Carswith, it is early, so why do Democrats have to get a candidate out there now? Well, uh, it is time already for them to begin laying groundwork for a campaign, which includes getting support down at the county level, raising money, uh, fielding staff. It is not too soon, even though most of us are still quite exhausted from the 2016 election. Um, and the other thing is that the Republicans have three top people who are going for the job, uh, potentially. Mike DeWine, the Attorney General, uh, John Husted and Lieutenant Governor uh, Mary Taylor. And so it looks as if those folks have already got, well, both uh, DeWine and, and uh, Husted, the Secretary of State, have two and a half million dollars in the bank already. Joe Ingalls, which candidate is the key? Which candidate has to decide first? Is it one of the big names, you know, Tim Ryan or Richard Cordray? Then others will either drop off or jump in? Well, I think there's going to have to be some agreement probably behind closed doors. Um, that seems to be the way it's been in the past. But um, knowing that, that's one of the things that a lot of Democrats are really upset about is that things go on behind closed doors and they would rather see, you know, an outward um, display of what's going on in a contest. So uh, I think one thing, though, that, that we've got to watch is uh, Rich Cordway right now does have a job in Washington, D.C., and uh, there hasn't been anything yet that's ousted him out of there. So I think Democrats have to make this decision soon because their, their candidate is running uphill uh, against the Republicans in fundraising. And if the candidate doesn't have, like a Cordray, great name recognition, they have they don't have much time to get their get their names out. I, if I was them, I would run candidates knowing that I'm not going to win, but being prepared for the next election. Um, I don't think they have the stalwarts uh, right now, name recognition or fundraising, to really be competitive with the uh, Republicans right now. Is Bob is name recognition? It's it's important. I'm not saying yeah. it's not important. But is it overemphasized? John Kasich didn't have huge name recognition when he no. ran. Um, Bernie Sanders didn't have huge name recognition. Barack Obama didn't. Well, and they and, all did and, well. And I'll give you even a most more recent example. Just this past year, uh, when Ted Strickland ran against Rob Portman, Ted Strickland had much higher name recognition than Rob Portman did, and it really didn't do you know him any good. Um, right before I walked in here today, I, I saw on Twitter there's another Democrat that is talking about. Um, running uh, who has a lot of name recognition that would be former congressman former cleveland mayor dennis kucinich um but see that's the democrats problem because when they have candidates like that out there uh what are they going to do and and sam i i would love that they just kind of put somebody up and let it go but the problem democrats have is 2018 is a, a very important election because who gets elected in 2018 is going to help decide what the new district lines are going to be uh, on a congressional level, which the Democrats don't like currently and want to change that. And the other issue here is that the Democrats, uh, at least as it's looking now, you know, there's, there's beginning to be already in the early weeks of this Trump presidency sort of a pushback on the, at the grassroots level that the Democrats are already trying to build uh, some momentum around for the coming cycle. And if they don't have a good candidate, as they did not the last time, uh, you know, they squander that opportunity, which may be a big national um, momentum for the Democratic Party. 
Bob, well, you said something that's important. The redis what? Redistricting next time is yeah. coming up, but it's going to be a lot fairer because of Common Cause and, <laughs> and, and, and other people. I forgot, Sam. You're right. Uh, it's going to be a lot that. fairer. It's not going to really matter. The yeah. state <laughs> district, not the congressional district. Right, right, but the state district is going to be yeah. a lot fairer. Oh, yeah. They worried about that, too. It. All right. <laughs> but it's still important for the, for those re for the redistricting because yes. Republicans still will control the apportionment board. Right. And all that well, the, well, what's going to happen if on the congressional lines, we're going to probably, the Republicans are probably still going to control control the Ohio House and the Ohio Senate. So the only way that the Democrats would be able to have some input into that process is if they can elect a Democrat governor, who then the legislature well, would well, have well, to work criteria with. criteria say that you can't favor uh, any particular party. Now, I know we're going to have to sue y'all <laughs> to make sure y'all do it right, but we are going to sue you if you don't but follow you the know, rules. We have to make sure that the Voting Rights Act is followed closely before we start worrying about anything yeah. on a partisan right. way. Okay, sorry well, about that. Well, we'll get to it. It's important. Um, <laughs> Joe Ingalls, it's a, how important is it to have a, a, a fresh face for the Democrats? I mean, you could argue that the, the Republicans have name recognition, but those are, these are folks who have been around for a while. Mike DeWine certainly has been around for a long mm -hmm. time. John Husted, House Speaker, then, then now uh, uh, Secretary of State, and now running for governor. Mary Taylor has been auditor and now lieutenant governor. If people want to change, those candidates aren't necessarily change candidates. If the Democrats have a change candidate, it has to be to their advantage. Well, you know, that's somewhat true, but let's let's also remember that Ed Fitzgerald was a fresh face um, for most of Ohio, and that was you know it was that a little too fresh. Yeah, a little <laughs> too fresh. I think the biggest thing for the Democrats is they're going to have to have to have a candidate that speaks to the very same voters that President Trump spoke to when he was out there. I mean, the Democrats have lost a significant part of their base um, with the uh, union members, with the manufacturing community, the people who went out and voted for Trump, they're up for grabs. So that's where Tim Ryan comes in, Julie, right? He's from Youngstown, Sherrod Brown is popular in that area. He'll be on the ballot. He may not get all of the Trump voters, but he's certainly gonna do better than Hillary Clinton did in those counties up in Northeast Ohio. Right, he can make he can make the argument. He, he came from, um, the trafficant, he was a young aide in, in trafficant's office at, in that valley, um, really looked at Trump as a, sort of a new Jimbo trafficant. You know, what would, what would Jimbo vote, who would he vote for in 2016? It was Donald Trump in many people's minds because they saw him as this populist kind of fighting for the working class. And, you know, the Democrats tried to push back against that. But, you know, if you have somebody who actually uh, worked for trafficking, as Tim Ryan did, and now obviously is making a big splash uh, in terms of uh, having run against Nancy Pelosi for House Speaker and getting his name out there. I'm seeing him a lot more <coughs> often on, on national news, and I think that that's uh, a way to get his name out there. You don't think that uh, Trump was a one-off candidate? Do you think this is going to be the voting patterns from now on out, the um, Trump model? I don't think so. I think each candidate, uh, based on his or her appeal, has to go out there and work the community, but I don't. I, I, if you take the Trump model, you had over performances in certain rural counties. People went from 50 percent turnout to 79 percent turnout. That, Bob, with Barack Obama, yeah. he won big right. in 2008, and 2010 came around. It was a wave election yeah. the other way. You know, every cycle has their own environment, political environment, and I don't know what next year's environment is going to be. And, and you know, a lot of it's going to be dictated on what happens in in D.C. more yeah. than what's happening in. Columbus, so we'll have to wait and see. All right. Since the disaster of Senate Bill 5, Ohio Republicans have been very wary of anti-union legislation, but some conservative lawmakers keep trying. A group of Ohio House Republicans have introduced a so-called right-to-work bill. That's where unions would no longer be able to charge mandatory dues to workers who refuse to join the union. This bill would also allow, would allow public workers to opt out of unions or paying so-called fair share dues, and unions would not have to represent workers who don't join. Sam Gresham, one lawmaker says it's not a matter of if, but when Ohio passes right to work legislation. Do you agree with him? I think they better be cautious about this. And the timing is important. Uh, which is House Bill 58 that they're touting now. It's the end of Kasich's term. Uh, the House is about to term over because of term limits. So if there's any way 
if the timing is good, it's good that way. But it's also the bad timing in preparation for the gubernatorial race. I don't know if you want to stick all this stuff out here. And the Democrats don't have a great candidate yet. Uh, I don't know if you want to stick all this stuff out here right now to ride, get people riled up around the, the next election when the, uh, Dem when the Republicans could win all those elections, sweep them all real easy. Do you really want to do that now? I don't think you want to do that now, and I'm not sure if Kasich's going to support it. On the flip side, I mean, Republicans have never had a better chance than now to do it. They have super majorities in both legislative chambers. They've got a complete control of the federal government. Um, and so it would make sense, and we're seeing it in many states, that the state legislatures are coming forward and uh, bringing the kind of legislation that has previously been reserved for, as, as Sam suggests, you know, uh, only sort of the far right uh, of the party, and it never even got a hearing in a Republican-led House. And now it looks as if some of these might move because there's confidence on the Republican side. Could this backfire, Bob? Sure. Um, I mean, we saw what happened in 2011, and there's always the possibility that could happen, but um, it, it just depends on, on when you do it, how you do it. Um, we are surrounded, except for Pennsylvania, all the rest of our neighboring states are right to work state. However, I think this could be uh, an issue that is maybe decided on the federal level. We had a court case going forward that hit the Supreme Court last year, but it was after Justice Scalia died, and they split 4-4 on it. Uh, and it meant that the, the lower court's decision uh, was upheld, which, which allowed unions to charge those dues. I see other cases like that, though, still in the stream. And once uh, Neil Gorsuch gets uh, approved for the court, you may see one of those kinds of cases going to the U.S. Supreme Court. And I think this time it would be a 5-4 decision don't against the union. Don't underestimate this in individual or movement that's going on now. All they need is something to grab onto, and this would be a great thing for them to grab onto in Ohio to organize around. So, Bob, I think you're right, but it could backfire, and it could backfire in such a way that it gives uh, gravity to all these organizations that are looking for something to organize around. But union membership, Joe, has declined. Most of the folks who are in unions now, the, most of them are in the large percentage, or most the big, the highest percentage of union members are public workers now, right. not auto manufacturers or coal right. miners, thing like that. Right. So it's been six years or so since Senate Bill 5. Senate Bill 5. Union membership's probably declined even more. It has. It has. But as, um, you know, this, this anti-Trump movement, I'll call it, mm -hmm. bubbles up, we're seeing a lot of these uh, things that people, you know, there was that kind of negative thing about a union, you know, that it, it, for a while it had a negative connotation when you went through Senate Bill 5. But now you're hearing a lot of, at these rallies and whatnot, you're hearing a lot of positives about unions and a lot of people talking about how you need to protect unions and people need to be in unions. And actually some groups are saying that they're uh, seeing some interest in, you know, people joining. So, you know, I don't think we can really apply the past to what's happening right now. Union, union voters voted for Trump for the most part. Right. Uh, and uh, we had some really key unions move over and endorse uh, folks like Senator Rob Portman, who's Republican last time, over Ted Strickland, who had been a real union uh, uh, guy and, and labor supporter. Mm -hmm. So I think the politics of unions got very complex last year, and, and uh, doing something like this will big be... Picture, big picture, what is the, the future of unions, Sam? I mean, the unions came in at a time when the working conditions were awful and they served a purpose, they you know, limited the work week, they had child labor laws, uh, safety regulations imposed, and made demands. Things aren't as bad now. Yeah, there's a wage gap, and the, there's, we're losing manufacturing jobs, but they're not as bad as they were during the- Things are worse. Right, let me give as, you, the, as the old mill days in the, in the early let 1900s? Let me give you this thing called a black box. You know what a black box is? Mm -hmm. All those white, co white collar jobs that used to be people pushing paper, it is now digitized. 
and thousands of people have lost those middle class jobs. You can start with operators. Remember you used to have an operator you used to talk to? Remember we used to call a place and there was a human being there? Thousands of people have lost their jobs and they've had to go places with lower wages. Automation has occurred in manufacturing sector. This is not what, what people are talking about. I was at the bank the other day and I was just kidding. People were standing around at the bank talking to each other, they workers. I went over to a teller machine, a machine. I didn't ask them. I got my money, I left. And I turned around to them and I said, that's going to replace you. All y'all standing around here? So it's getting worse. I don't think people have really recognized yeah, that. Yeah, but I think the problem that unions have today is this whole fact that people are forced to pay dues and they're forced to be represented by the union. What I like about this bill that's been introduced in the Ohio House is that it works both ways. The person's not forced to pay a due, their dues to the union, and the union then is not forced to represent that person. And I think that's the way it should work. This should be something voluntary that you belong to. I've never understood how in our country, where we have all these freedoms, that we don't allow people to not belong to something. But practically, the unions can't, re can't represent one union member and the guy who's working next to him who's not the union. I mean, they're both, they're all yeah, in the same I group. mean, but the problem is you can't force people to belong to something they don't want to belong to. Yeah, but, but that's that, not the American way. But that's never really been the issue. The issue is that no, the, the issue is money to the unions, and they don't want to give up the money. Who I fight for the yeah. uh, Democratic Party? But that's a much more fundamental issue too. I, I, unions are the most important part of stabilizing the economy for middle class families. They fight for those families. The seven day work week, the health rules, all the things that we got came from unions. Five day work. I mean, five day work week, not seven. <laughs> I don't want to work tomorrow. Sir. <laughs> I don't want to work. Sir. <laughs> but all these things came from unions. It was not voluntarily yeah, like given up said, by the yeah, owners. Maybe 50 years ago we needed that, but we don't need that right We're now. We're going to need it more in, in the future years than we did it then. But that the, might unions gain more strength as this wage cap widens and as they haven't so far i mean it's been there for quite a long time this income inequality and the unions have gotten weaker versus getting millennials stronger millennials understand better about the impact of oh, the oh i don't think don't the millennials get, are going to be oh, big unions don't go people. there on, don't go there on uh, me now. <laughs> i don't think they <laughs> we will we shall be. see uh, <laughs> the thing in the state budget that affects most ohioans and that drives the budget is taxes right. governor Kasich wants to cut the income tax again and he wants to increase and widen the sales tax. Past income tax cuts have not really led to big gains in jobs or wages. So some at the state house also want to eliminate the sales tax on tampons and other feminine hygiene products, which raises questions on which products should be subject to the sales tax. Bob, first to the income yeah. tax. I looked at the median wage since these all these tax cuts began under the Taft administration yeah. around 2000 or so. The median hourly wage of Ohioans has dropped by a dollar an hour since all these tax cuts started. Mm -hmm. Can you out reasonably say that the tax cuts are helping the state's economy? Well, the, the, it, you can also do the inverse too. What would the economy be like if we hadn't had those tax cuts? And you know, either way, we can't answer that question. We don't know. Uh, we could look at maybe other states that raised their income tax and see how they did with their you know, jobs. And, and, but everywhere, everyone has lost um, their their pay power in the last 10 15 years and that's a big problem which leads to income inequality and all that but i get where the governor's coming from I mean, you know the governor has a philosophical belief here that you know the income tax is not good and he's been while governor trying to do whatever he can to shift that away from income and over to sales which a lot of people don't like but it's something he believes in. I believe in it. I think it would be good for our, our, our state as um, we don't have a lot of things in Ohio that can attract people to come here to work or to do business. And I think not having an income tax will help us to attract those kinds of people. Um, Kasich did not, uh, however, get the resounding endorsement of the Americans for Tax Reform, the Grover Norquist group, which generally is important when you're trying to push a tax plan through a legislature. That group is the creator of the tax, um, the anti-tax pledge, and they like it. They will support a tax uh, package as long as it, is, it has a net in, a decrease yeah. or is flat. But they said that in the case of Kasich's, it looks to them as if the income tax reduction is just a rounding error. You know, something like, isn't it $39 million out of this huge uh, 
package and that they didn't think that it was quite as impressive as the one Bob, he Bob, made before. I, I disagree with you. Where's the research that supports that uh, lowering taxes and increasing prosperity? And particularly in this governor's tax package, he's, he's taxing alcohol, he's taxing tobacco, he's taxing uh, things that poor people buy. It's the most regressive tax budget that you see. How is this helping anything? And one what? thing to note, uh, over the past few tax cuts, those income tax cuts have not amounted to enough money that the businesses have then taken those income tax savings and, and generated jobs with them. We're just not seeing those jobs from those tax cuts, and that's huge. Well, I think the problem we're going to have here, if we don't do the tax cuts and we just hold everything even, or m probably what you'd rather have, Sam, is that we increase taxes because everybody wants to increase funding for schools and for services and everything else. Uh, how's that going to affect our economy? Yeah, but we're increasing taxes anyway. You cut the state taxes and the county and the school board and everybody else puts taxes on people. So we're increasing taxes anyway. It's just not state taxes, but everybody else has to make up for the loss of state money by increasing fees and taxes on a local level. Where is so it? we're raising taxes. Where is the, uh, it's, it's a national movement called Free the Tampon, no, put, don't charge taxes on feminine hygiene products. Free the Tampon. That's what, that's what the movement's called. <laughs> is I didn't it name it. Jail? Yeah. Somewhere? Is that? That's what they call it. Okay. okay. <laughs> We're not going to go there. But what, where does this come from, Julie? Is it, is it, will, it, will it succeed at the state house? Is well, well, I mean, the, the idea obviously comes from if you, uh, if you are a female yeah. uh, and you have to use these products on a regular basis. We're looking at are they taxing men's shaving cream? <laughs> are they taxing uh, razors that men use or whatever? And so it's, it's viewed by some who support the movement as sort of a, a unfair. It's a necessity. Right. So it's like when we don't tax food in Ohio. I think it's right. I mean, like but that's the only thing we don't tax is mm -hmm. food. Yeah. And I mean, razors are taxed, uh, condoms are taxed. We can go there to um, you know, so it's like, why are we creating this this little niche for this it product? Is, it is beautiful. I don't care what you say. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I mean, but uh, so that I think that's why you know uh, it's gotten that kind because it's got a very creative marketing yes, of the. Well, do we ta do we do we tax like cough <laughs> medicine or do we tax band aids? Also, things that are kind of medically yeah. necessary. Yes, right. yes. Yeah. So. Depends on what, what kind yeah. it is. Yeah. 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 We tax cigarettes to the hill. Well, that's, yeah. that's not a necessity, though. No, uh, you ask some people. <laughs> <laughs> right. Get to our last topic. Uh, many of us have brought our child to work. Now, Governor Kasich wants kids to bring their teachers to their parents' work. Under Governor Kasich's budget proposal, teachers would be required to job shadow with local businesses in order to renew their licenses. Kasich calls it an externship. The requirement aims to give teachers an idea of what skills students need to get good paying jobs after high school. Jeringles, what's been the reaction of teachers to this? Teachers are insulted. They are highly insulted because they think Field that... Field trip, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the, here's the assumption. Um, they think that the reason the governor wants this is because teachers aren't teaching the right things. And they're, you know, they're saying it's more complicated than that. We can't get the, the students prepared because, they, number one, they say that the balls keep changing that are in the air and the rules keep changing all the time. That's a problem. They say that another problem is that they've got kids who are coming to classes who have more issues than ever and they're not being met at home. They're, the needs are not being met. So they're having to be mom and dad before they can be a teacher. They're saying that, you know, this kind of assumption that just throwing them into a business and letting them observe for three days and see what they need, that's not something that's going to help and it just takes time off task for other things. We keep hearing this concern that business owners and managers saying we're not getting the the skills that we need to have a good workforce. Yeah, but she, she, hit a, she hit a bell. Leave it to Beaver is over. We don't have those families uh, in America as much as we had before. We have different families with different structures, and, and the needs of the children, black, white, are uh, different. The educational system has to change if we're going to do this. Now, everybody think it's STEM and it's everything else. It's the foundation and the culture of the young people who are coming to this school. It's what they believe and what they don't believe. And, the, and, and we have to tackle that before Bob, we can educate Bob, them. What, 
what do you what do you think? Would, would this help? I, I like this idea, okay? And we already have something like this in place with legislators, state legislators, and judges, where they they pair up and they switch one or they they stay together, but they're together in the court for one day and they're in the uh, in the legislature one day together. And it gives both of them their own, you know, a different uh, uh, viewpoint of what the other one's trying to do. I think for teachers, it would be great to be open to the idea of seeing how businesses work. But I'd also make sure that businessmen would go into the classroom to see the challenges that yeah. teachers we're have. Gonna, we're going to get to our off-the-record parting shots, and we will start with Sam Gresham. Um, the ACA is changing this country. I was in Washington, D.C., and there's a confluence of people who make money off of ACA coming together with the activists. It's not going to be hard, easy for these Republicans to change the law. Uh, it's an interesting combination. Uh, we Bob. talked about the Democrats in 2018. Obviously, the Republicans have a, a much different problem. We have too many people that want to run, and I still think we're going to have a lot of shakeout in that whole Republican field before uh, we have a filing deadline next year. Julie. Uh, I have a little prop here. This was uh, when Jerry Springer ran uh, and was wor in politics last time. We didn't mention him as a Democrat, but he would certainly be a high name recognition if he ran in a Trump era. So this was a cake. And how old is that cake, Joe? I think it's about 10 years old at <laughs> least. <laughs> and Joe. And to piggyback on what Julie said, uh, he, we saw Jerry Springer at a recent CMC and he won the crowd over big time. I mean, people really liked him and took to him. So uh, don't count him out as a candidate. Yeah, he's on tour. He's in Cincinnati this week. He's in Columbus in a few weeks. He's Price my is, candidate. Price is right. I um, like him. That's what, <laughs> that's what Democrats said about Donald Trump, remember? Yeah, uh, that's the true. City Car Charter Commission, uh, they're looking at ways to change up city council. Apparently, they're going to recommend expanding council to nine members. Members would have to live in certain districts, but they would be elected citywide and no restrictions on campaign fundraising. So it does not take the big money out of city council races, if that's the deal. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online, Facebook, Twitter, and you can see each episode at our website, wosu.org. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.